Hello and welcome to the special edition of Crossover. I'm Yi Ishu outside of the CCTV Tower on this hazy day in Beijing. Air pollution has been a challenging problem in China and it was one of the key issues that Beijing had to address when bidding for the 2022 Winter Olympics. In fact, Beijing has promised a sustainable Olympics, but what does that entail and how will they achieve it? In a few moments, we'll answer these questions and more in the CCTV studio when I'll be joined by key members involved in bringing the Olympics back to Beijing. Um, Julian, welcome to Crossover. Thank you. <laughs> so, Julian, I know you are very much a sports enthusiast, uh, and you've brought some of the most important sporting events uh, to the world. Tell me about the experience. You know, IOC, you've worked with BOCOG, um, and now you're working with another sports events company. Tell me about this experience. So I've been involved in the Olympics for a long time. I had the chance to be a volunteer actually at the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. That was my first involvement in the Olympics. Then I came to China as a student and I happened to be in Beijing on the night that the 2008 Olympic Games were awarded to Beijing. Right. And that was an extraordinary experience. I remember being in a taxi uh, stuck in traffic as so often um, and the taxi driver had the announcement on the radio and so the moment approached where Sam Ranch was about to announce the city and he turned up the volume and all the cars came to a stop and suddenly you heard the Beijing. city of Beijing. And uh, the driver honked his horn and all the cars stopped and everyone jumped out of the cars and was celebrating and cheering and we got out of the car and cheered along and it was a, an extraordinary moment, I think, for me being in Beijing, but I think for everyone uh, in the city. And now you're coming full circle again because as we know, in 2015, Beijing was once again awarded the Olympics, this time the Winter Olympics. Let's take a look at the clip of Beijing being awarded the 2022 Winter Olympic Games. Olympic Winter Games 2022. Beijing! Yeah! Well, we have six more years. Uh, it's 2016. The Games is 2022. And we also have two guests who were part of that very successful bid. I want to thank you, Dr. Zhang Li and Dr. Song Chang, for being here today. It's great to be here. <laughs> thank you. Nice to meet you. So tell me about this moment. You know, both of you had worked very hard for this bid. Of course, it's a very <laughs> sweet sense of winning. Of course, you have all the dopamine building up in your body. But I happen to be not a very emotional person. So after that excitement at the first or second, OK, but then you come to the feeling, OK, we have got the chance to prove that we can do it. We will prove that Beijing can do something really sustainable, really good right. with this Olympics. Right. For Beijing, and uh, you know, we have uh, the opponent is Almaty and uh, the nature environment or the sustainability is not uh, our good is uh, a really big chain challenge for Beijing mm. and so and we have to do many many works because you know we are good at the experience we are good at uh, venues we have the stronger economic support and etc and uh, in many aspects we are better but uh, uh, not very good at the uh, you're yeah, absolutely right. ability because so I so you know, if, uh, uh, if the result is different, and we will have this heavy burden for all our life. Yeah. <laughs> or you'd have to bid for the 2026 Olympics. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we cried more or less. Yeah. <laughs> and you're probably glad that you so, didn't have to do the bid process yeah, again. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you're absolutely right, because I think, you know, when Beijing won that yeah. bid, a lot yeah. of people, a lot of the international media right away said, oh my gosh, Beijing was awarded this, but they don't even have snow, you know, mm -hmm. in these areas. Mm -hmm. This also came from the you know, the, I guess the legacy of what was a very successful Olympics in 2008. And I want to go back to those Olympics. I mean, we talked about it, Julian, you know, and, and, and what sort of things we learned from those Olympics, because I think that played a very big role in the decision by the IOC um, just last year. So tell me about that experience with 2008, because you were part of the organizing yeah. committee back mm -hmm. then, too. What do you feel like we learned um, from the Beijing Olymp Summer Olympics? And uh, 
I think it's very important. It is uh, some uh, in some content is key uh, factor, and the IOC uh, can give Beijing this uh, their confidence in the bidding team, and they met many. Uh, old friends from the 2008, and um, including myself, and including uh, many other uh, colleagues, and uh, so they know that uh, they are ex experienced uh, uh, team. That's one. The second is that uh, you know Beijing. We have the 2008. We have uh, left uh, a amount of uh, venues and uh, uh, very uh, strong uh, infrastructure. And uh, so in Beijing, you know, uh, for example, the the L uh, plan, the the transport from Beijing to mm. any city in this earth, and uh, we can fly to more than two hundred uh, cities and right. from Beijing directly. You don't you, you don't need to transfer, and but for some other cities, it's not easy. So that is one of the. Uh, Lexis from 2008 is uh, the infrastructure and right. values. I, absolutely. I mean, Dr. Tang, mm -hmm. you are an architect. Yeah. So this whole idea of infrastructure and um, how Beijing transformed itself in 2008, this played a very big role. Indeed. Right? I'm talking about infrastructure, there are, of course, things like hardware, yeah. trains, railways, and mm -hmm. highways, and all these kind of airports. But there is also software. It's mm. the internationalization of the civil life in Beijing, hugely different mm. from the pre-Olympic years. And that, I believe, is the biggest gain of the city of Beijing. Yeah. If you want to compete in the world in the 21st century, you have to internationalize. Right. Um, then, after 2008, I believe the focus of holding a world event had slightly shifted yeah. from the creation of spectacles and monumentality towards sustainability. Right, right. Because 2008 was all about creating a spectacle. It was, yeah. you know, people called it Beijing's coming out party, you know, coming out to the world and, yeah. and presenting itself to the world. I mean, mm -hmm. from an IOC perspective, you know, were you surprised at what Beijing was able to accomplish leading up to 2008? Certainly very impressed. I, I'm not sure whether surprised because I think right from the start it was clear that this was an extraordinary bid and was going to be an extraordinary games in China um, because it's, it was the first time it was the game, the first time that the games were coming to, mm. to China um, at, a, at a time where China was going through a huge amount of, of development. development, right? Yeah. And so I think everyone knew that this was going to be a, a huge thing and I think Beijing proved the world right with right. extraordinary yeah. cer ceremonies, amazing venues, you know, a great sure. sporting uh, celebration. It was a, a, a very memorable moment. Dr. Zhang, when you say like this transformation of the civil society, you know, can you get more specific? Like what happened? You know, what were the things that um, the how did the Beijing people change as a result of the Olympics? It's all about opening yourself up. Yeah. You learn to speak to communicate with the international world. You need to be more tolerant of different cultures. You need to actually appreciate, accept, and mutually benefit from different cultures. As part of the, the, the games and the games organization, um, there were a lot of other ancillary projects that were run. People sort of remember the 100 meter dash, but actually as part of the Olympic preparation, there are all kinds of other projects that are run, including, for example, an Olympic education program at the time. So there were, the organizing committee was working with, I think, 250,000 school, schools across China yeah. to well, educate kids about the Olympics and the Olympic values and the history and um, the, the values of excellence and friendship and respect and all these sort of things. And I think for the IOC, from the IOC's point of view, being able to reach such a huge audience sure. by staging a games in a country like China was an enormous asset. Mm -hmm. Right, right, because it's not only about that yeah. event, right? The, sure. Those three weeks at the Olympics and, and afterwards the Paralympics represent, it was about all of those years in preparation and the aftermath and yeah. the Olympics kind of became this catalyst yeah. for yeah. accelerated development, so to speak, yes. and, and yes. modernization. It's mm -hmm. almost like a lens yeah. through which you watch the world and actually you know yourself better. Right. Sure. So the Winter Olympics is always seen as a, a much smaller scale event than the summer, summer Olympics. So, you know, I want to ask you why, you know, after the success of this huge Olympics in 2008, why did Beijing want to bid for 
the Winter Olympics. We've already done it. We've already shown the world how, how great Beijing could be. Well, as you put it, the Olympics and the spirit, the values of Olympics itself, it's something like a catalyst for civil society development, for the development of a culture, of a country. And certainly, um, the Winter Games is particularly so. If you think about the issues Winter Games addresses, um, actually they're not small, they're huge. Like the relationship between man and nature, because you deal with, you're dealing with a lot of mountains. Right. Like the issue, say, how do you balance between the civil society activity in the winter and in summer. So actually it's all about being small, but at the same time being smart. And so Beijing's approach for 2022 is going to be very different. You said it earlier. You said whereas 2008 was going to be a spectacle, 2022 is all about sustainability. And we're going to get into one of the most challenging issues of this Winter Olympics, which is sustainability. When we come back, please stay tuned. It's, it's a permanent solution yes. for our people, not yes. just for the participants. You don't build these facilities and infrastructure for the success of a event. The new airport that was built and the, the new urban rail network that was built, I mean, all of that is in constant use at the moment. And welcome back to Crossover, where we're talking about preparations for the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. Before the break, we were talking about the legacies from Beijing 2008. And we alluded to some of the... Um, biggest challenges that we're seeing for 2022. Um, Dr. Zhang, sustainability, you know, this is one of the biggest issues and one of the biggest, mm, I guess, most visible aspects of sustainability and, and environmentalism for me is obviously Beijing and this air pollution that we're always been talking about. Um, back in 2008, I, I remember I was here, there were temporary closures of the factories. Um, we uh, had the odd even license restrictions, but they all seem to be temporary measures. Uh, how are we going to resolve this for 2022? Is it going to be a different approach? I think 2022 is driving Beijing to be more determined. Um, extremely tough measures on air pollution, and actually Dr. Song is yeah. much better of an expert than me in this <laughs> regard. And <clears throat> regarding the air pollution, and uh, we should uh, uh, look at this uh, issue and uh, from the historic uh, background. You know, first of all, air pollution is not the uh, occurred in Beijing, uh, in China, and you know, and it's come with the industrialization process and from the 1950s, uh, from London, from uh, Los Angeles, all of these uh, uh, industrialized nations in the uh, mixed cities, they had uh, made air pollution problems before. Mm. Uh, of course, we, will learn, we have studied their work. We have uh, researched their uh, experience and the lessons, and uh, we learn from them how to prevent and eliminate the air pollution. That's the first part. The second is regarding uh, how to guarantee the air quality. In Are you guaranteeing the air yes. quality for of 2022? Course, of course, of course, we can. Uh, you know, first, and uh, you know, 2008. And uh, uh, we have that uh, promise for the 2008. And at that time, we have guaranteed that uh, uh, during the game time, and uh, we will uh, provide the air quality, met the WHO standards. And we did. We have uh, fulfilled our promise and uh, completely. So that uh, is very important uh, uh, evidence that we can do it. Uh, I mean, for game time. You know, we started the, we fighting the air pollution from the 1998, and we take a stage by stage of uh, uh, action plan to fighting the air pollution, and after that, the air quality have been improved. Uh, in my view, is dramatically, it's remarkable. The song is, is, is right in the sense that, mm -hmm. of course, there were also measures that were permanent. Sure. It's just important to see it in the context of the wider development yeah. and you know, the, the sort of colossal development that Beijing is undergoing and yeah. some of that overshadows of course the good works that are that are happening on that that front so in some sense you know, it's great to have the Olympics come back to town drawing the spotlight yet again to sure. air quality and sort of putting the efforts that are being made towards improving the air quality in yeah. the wider context and the, the wider efforts to improve the. so why we have yeah. the confidence because uh, and we 
uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of work on the uh, tracing the source of the emission, where it come from. Mm. For example, from the coal burning, from the vehicle, mm. from the earth dust, and from the industrial emissions from factories, etc. We have uh, all this essential information about where the pollutants is coming from. You know, mm -hmm. we also have the modern technologies, technicals, how to uh, enhance the efficiency, how to remove these pollutants during the production process. And also, uh, we have uh, abundant uh, uh, investment. I mean, we have the economic power we can. We have the five year of uh, uh, air, air pollution control uh, action plan. And, uh, right. Yeah. So you're saying th th there's this five year plan. Yeah. It's yeah. not just for the Olympics. Yes. It's for China. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's a for permanent our solution yes. for our people, not yes. just for the participants of uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, Olympians. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, absolutely. Do you think promise. that yeah. we have accelerated this plan because of the Olympics? Uh, of course. Of course. Of course. Let's course. talk about the sustainability issue, you know, in, in infrastructure development, because this was something that you were very much involved in, Dr. Zhang. Yes, urban development, construction, and all this kind of updating of infrastructure for all the uh, including both the city, the towns, and also the villages, mountainous areas. Actually, the sustainability issue, they are not separate issues, isolated issues like pollution, like, say, transportation. Mm. They are all connected. Yeah. And this whole sustainability thing is about three issues. The first is actually um, the decentralized of resource. As we always say... What does say, that mean when you say decentralized resource? A fairer resource. world is a much better world. Okay. The concentration of resource in major cities, in metropolitan mm. cities, actually make the villages, the towns surrounding it, suffer. So we have to actually shift all the opportunities and resources right. to the grand or the greater Beijing area, which includes Hebei province, includes Jiang mm -hmm. and currently the 2022 actually is dealing with the regional development, both Beijing and Jiang right. and Hebei. Yeah. which is great. Right. Yeah. And the second thing about sustainability is about where you develop the infrastructure and all the facilities. You don't build these facilities and infrastructure for the success of an event. You build for the long-term success after it. And you simply use it for the event. Mm. And the third thing about sustainability addresses the issue with man and nature. Yeah. The reconciliation of the conflict between man-made artificial things and nature things. That means replace of heavy industries, by all means. Right. Snow, winter sports, ice sports, the so-called white industry, they will replace the so-called black industry, like coal-based, mining-based industry, right. yeah. which is currently basically um, the sure. dominating industry in the Zhangjiakou area. Right, the Zhangjiakou yeah. area is very heavily in yeah. industrial area, so this will be... It is be, green industrious, yeah. Yeah, this mm -hmm. will transform that local area. Yeah. Absolutely. I think to your, to your second point in terms of you know, the, the developments happening not just for the 17 days of the games, but actually for the long-term benefit of the city, is something that we can see very strongly coming from the 2008 games. You know, if you think about the new airport that was built and the, the new urban rail network that was built, I mean, all of that is in constant use at the moment. Um, some of the venues that are very heavily used uh, the, the conference center, for example, that is, that is constantly being used. Right. So, These venues were, have been very successful, and, and many of them are being used um, you know, on a regular basis. I mean, you could think about Wukasong, the basketball arena. Well, that is a champion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 Olympic facility Model, reuse. Yes. Right. And a lot of these venues, you said before, are going to be used again for 2022. Let's take a look at that clip, um, a clip of some of the venues that we'll be using in 2022. The 2022 Winter Olympic Games will be spread across three main locations. Beijing will host the events contested on ice, while the snow sports take place in Yanqing and Zhangjiakou, on the outskirts of the capital. The 2008 Summer Olympics bequeathed to Beijing a number of iconic stadiums, and they will be fully used in the Winter Games of 2022. The opening and closing ceremonies will be held at the Bird's Nest, the Water Cube will play host to the curling events. The National Sports Center and the Wukasong Indoor Stadium will serve as ice hockey arenas. 
and the short track speed skating and figure skating competitions will take place at the Capitol Stadium. A brand new venue, the National Speed Skating Hall, is also being built. In addition, seven new ski resorts are being developed. These will augment the existing facilities at Yunding and Wanlong in Zanjiakou, which are undergoing improvement, as is the Nanshan Resort, which, 40 miles drive from central Beijing, has for several years been the most accessible destination for the capital skiing enthusiasts. So it seems like in, in uh, the Beijing city, you know, we're going to be reusing a lot of these venues. But where most of the new development is going to happen is, as you mentioned... Outside Beijing. Outside of Beijing. The city proper, yes. Outside yes. the city proper. Right. And what are some of those challenges there? Um, well, as I said, it's the replace of industry. Actually, these are not the challenges. Right. Um, the challenge is actually the reallocating of resources, um, such as water reuse. Um, but the infrastructure is already there. You mm -hmm. have reservoirs, you have all the pipes, you have the storages. Really? It's all yes. there? Yes, it's all okay. there. Okay. So it shouldn't be much of an issue. Okay. And my impression from that sort of area over the past 10 or so years is that there's been a huge amount of sort of local tourism to those areas yeah. already and it's growing quite fast. So you have people from the city of Beijing who are going out into the outlying areas, to, whether it's skiing in the winter or other activities in the summer. So this sort of increase of infrastructure is clearly not just for, for that period of the games, but actually is yeah. supporting a trend it that has has already already begun. Indeed, I mean, like, indeed. The yeah, process I mean, is already there. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I mean, well, Zhangjiakou, Chongli in yeah. particular, I mean, I've mm -hmm. been going to the ski resorts there for the last few years. They definitely exist. It's not something that we're making up because of the Olympics. Um, and it's growing. I mean, in terms of the volume of people who go there yeah. during the winter, yeah. it's been growing tremendously. I, you know, I mm -hmm. feel like I'm hearing mm -hmm. something very different from mm -hmm. what I was reading mm -hmm. in reports mm -hmm. when, we, when Beijing was first awarded the Olympics. You know, because mm -hmm. what I read in some of the major newspapers was, oh, how, you know, again, Beijing, with the lack of snow, we're going to have to bring in water to, <laughs> to um, you know, to make all of the snow. You know, mm -hmm. Zhangjiakou is, what, 100 miles away mm -hmm. from Beijing proper, so we're going to have to transport everybody by high-speed rail and the cost of this infrastructure and the environmental toll mm -hmm. um, on the surrounding areas. I, am I, is the reality a, a little bit different? I mean, what... Well, actually, these are not very tough questions um, because uh, actually these were the questions that right. I have been frequently asked yeah. from the IOC up to right? the yes, presentation this, yeah. in Lausanne. Press. Up to Lausanne, no more question about these yeah. issues. Mm -hmm. Say, transportation, easy. We are building this national high-speed rail n network. Yeah. Disregard of the bidding process. Right. It's there. We are using it rather than we are building it for 2022. Right. Second, for water and snow. Of course, actually, the use of artificial snow is preferred by the athletes. Right. It has been the norm for the Winter Games. Really? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. And for water, we are actually replacing the use of water for mining industry, for coal industry, with the water for snow and winter sports. It's mm. basically cycled, recycled right. in nature. Mm. It's just evaporation and recollection. And all also, the infrastructure for water storage, mm. for snow-making devices, they're already there. So I'm guessing this is why it was so compelling to the IOC? Yeah. That you're, I mean, this idea of sustainability, was it always part of the bidding process? Well, I think the idea of sustainability, of course, has always been important in terms of hosting the Olympic Games. The city will always want to make sure it's not just for that period of the Games, but for the long-term benefit of the city. I think the IOC has sort of treated it with gradually with more importance as the games have grown in size and made it part of the formal bidding process mm. so that now when a city bids for the Olympic Games there has to be you know, a, a concrete sort of proposal on how venues are reused and, and how the effort that goes into the games is then used long term. So now the decision on awarding a games is actually based on in part on what those plans are. Right, and how it's going to affect the local community. Sure. Well, when we come back, we're going to be joined by another guest who has been heavily involved in the winter sports industry here in China. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Crossover, where we're talking about the upcoming preparations for the 2022 Beijing Olympic Games. Um, we're joined by Simon Adams, who is from the UK. Uh, Simon, you know, you have this amazing job. Uh, you basically build these freestyle and aerial courses for ski resorts. Um, must be amazing. It's, uh, well, for 
for us, obviously, it's very interesting and um, gives us an opportunity to be very creative. Um, it's a little bit art, a little bit engineering, and uh, a lot of hard work in some very difficult conditions on the mountain. But getting to see uh, either professional athletes or amateur skiers, um, people who've come from Beijing to uh, enjoy uh, snow sports in that area, to be able to watch them um, play on something that we've built and have a good time is uh, very rewarding for us. Has it surprised you, the enthusiasm for winter sports <laughs> by the Chinese? I think especially in the last couple of years, we've seen a, a really, uh, we've seen a really big growth in the number of uh, Chinese who are getting into winter sports. And we've seen a big growth in the investment as well in the infrastructure for winter sports. And we've seen a lot of new resorts opening. And when my friend, he was, or my, my business partner, he was working um, on the resort in Chongli at the time when I first met him, this was the first high-speed chairlift going in in that area. And now we have gondolas, we have heated chairlifts, high-speed, dual-speed, everything. Um, and this kind of uh, technology is on par with anything oh, in, in, in the world. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm an avid skier and snowboarder, so I've skied all around the world. Mm. <laughs> but, you know, some of these Beijing lifts are the best lifts that I've ever built yeah. because, you know, they're starting from scratch. You could put in the newest technology. Yeah. Well, of course, China is a huge market when it yeah. comes to winter sports. I mean, virtually untapped, just starting. Um, let's take a look at a video clip about this market opportunity. Nationwide, the country had fewer than 10 ski resorts 20 years ago. But today, the number exceeds 500. As for skating, Beijing now has 17 professional rinks, regularly visited by over a million young skaters. What the 2022 Winter Olympics promise is much more than just two sporting competition. The Games are also expected, by sparking the enthusiasm of China's 1.3 billion people, to give rise to a thriving winter sports scene that will captivate the nation well into the future. So all of this was filmed in Zhangjiakou. There's snow. <laughs> you can see snow on the yep. neighboring mountains. Um, well, you know, you're involved in a lot of different sporting events. How do you see you know, the, the development of winter sports. Are Chinese really starting to uh, get on the bandwagon when it comes to skiing and, you know, ice skating was always there, but how do you see this development? I think so. I think we're in a very interesting period for sports at the moment in China. Um, you know, we, we've, we've been through the Olympics in 2008, which was in many ways a starting point. Um, we have a president who is a declared fan of sports, which is great. Um, <laughs> we have now government policies to encourage the development of a sports yeah. industry right. in China with an expectation of you know, the sports industry here being valued at 800 billion US dollars by 2025. So it's a very positive environment in which to now bring the winter sports. And I think as we were saying a little earlier, there is already an enthusiasm for winter sports in right. Beijing and but around. But winter and sports is expensive, right? I mean, it's... The, well, actually, the... if you work with the terrain, it's not so expensive. Mm. Um, actually, yeah. um, winter sports, it's a production of the booming middle class. If you look back into history in European countries, about um, at the turn of the century, from the 19th to the 20th century, you have the booming middle class, and then you have winter sports. Mm. You have all the resorts. Um, Chinese economy has developed more or less to that point. Mm. And also sports on ice and on snow is different. Right. Uh, yeah, many, many uh, the old citizens in Beijing, and they, they're often to do ice the skate. ice skating yeah, in winter. Right. I think and, there was a great moment yeah. actually in the bid presentation yeah. where there was an image of... Um, uh, of uh, Hou Hai in yes, the winter yes. when it's frozen <laughs> over <laughs> with people yeah, in, yeah. The, in the sort of chairs I pushing them that. Yeah, exactly. yes. so, so, yeah, there's, there's children, clearly a nice yeah. sort of uh, activity it's culture true. in China. Yeah, it's, right? a, it's sure. very much a part of the Beijing winter uh, yeah. scene, right? Yeah. Everybody yeah. on Hou Hai Lake. Traditional acti uh, activities. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I heard you in also winter. had Yao Ming in the in the in the bid video yeah, as well he was a hockey he was on ice skates too right sure, 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 sure. <laughs> he was being the goalkeeper <laughs> yes mm -hmm. um simon you know earlier in the show we spent almost half of the show talking about sustainability mm. and the environmental aspects of these games and i know that you're 
an environmentalist as well. You know, how do you, you know, you, you heard the conversation backstage. Yeah. You know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you see from that angle uh, in Zhang Jiaqo? Well, I make the journey very regularly from Beijing to Zhang Jiaqo, and what I see is already very encouraging um, because I see the electric charging stations getting installed in the service stations on the highway and um, I see that in certain areas around Beijing there are already these uh, electric taxis the, 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 the using these Beijing automobile company electric taxis and I hear that uh, the Beijing automobile company is already sponsoring one of the big sponsors for the Olympics mm. um, and there's going to be the high-speed rail, which is maybe not yet taking me to Chongli, but it's going to be, uh, we'll be there, developed right? yeah, um, in due course. And I think this is all uh, fantastic. And we see already a lot of um, a big increase in the workforce associated with the ski industry in Chongli and in Jandrako. And I think if this can provide a a kind of easy transition for people moving away mm. from the the more polluting industries then that's uh, that's going to be mm. it's going to be good and what well. about the snow making aspects of things the snow making um, in terms of the water use or right. power use um, because for power the Jenja Ko Chongli area is a pretty good is doing uh, is a pretty good advert for uh, sustainable power production because it's covered with wind farms. Right. Yep. So I don't know what the, the kind of power, whether this is covering uh, uh, the, 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 the consumption needs of, of Zhangjiakou or Beijing or Chongli, but um, visually it's a very encouraging sign to see all those wind farms you drive out uh, to Zhangjiakou. You can't miss them, they're drive, huge. You can't miss them, and all around the mountains in, 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 in Chongli as well. Right. Um, and that's, uh, for me, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's a very uh, good sign from the power use side. And then from the water side, we've ha had some big projects in the ski resorts in uh, Chongli around Jianjiakou, and we've not ever felt too much uh, pressure that, you know, that we're going to, that there's a, a shortage of water. And we produce the snow for the resorts. And because of the really cold temperatures in that area with uh, careful maintenance of the slopes and good snow grooming techniques, we don't have to continually make snow mm. um, as would maybe be the case in some warmer regions or in other places uh, uh, around the world. So I think for the use of uh, water, I think it's, the demand is not going to be um, as spectacular as, as, as people are imagining. We already have water left at the end of the season we're not we're not running out of water by the end of the season and like i say we're doing some pretty big uh constructions already using a lot of snow and we do mm. mainly pure snow stuff so no no right. shape or no feature underneath we use pure snow so a whole you know feature maybe thousand cubic meters will push it into the shape that's required for the competition and we can change it we can move it around it doesn't disappear it stays so, there we just right. push it into new because shapes because it's so cold because it's so yeah. cold yeah sure. so for 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 from from um, if we look at it in that way, I think that Chongli is actually quite, quite... Right, so uh, you're not concerned at all in terms it. of the snow. Well, yeah. Maybe uh, there is a number that can be added to Simon's comment, mm. and he is mm. absolutely correct in saying that we have done a survey of the water used for snow yeah. making for mm -hmm. the games and for the entire duration yeah. of 2022, which is about 50 days more or less, we'll say. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you have about 1% of the annual water supply. So the demand, it's... It's literally a drop in the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, when we come back, we are going to be joined by one of China's top snowboarders. Um, so you don't want to miss out on that. Please stay with us. So far, still the best in China. Okay. We, the Chinese, can do it. I can do it very well. China hopes to become, you know, a new center for winter sports. And winter sports is all about the spirit of exploration and adventure. Welcome back to Crossover. And before the break, I promise everybody that I will be bringing on one of China's most famous and uh, successful snowboarders here. We have Liu Jiayu, and you are one of China's top female snowboarders. Welcome to Crossover. Thank you. My pleasure here. So, Jiayu, you won fourth 
in yes. the 2010 Vancouver Olympics. Yes. And you've also won a number of world championships. Um. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it was his first Chinese athlete win mm. World Cup or championships, everything first. Awesome. Yeah. I'm so excited. Let's take a look at Liu Jiayu in action. Amazing! How long have you been snowboarding for? Um, star 2003. That okay. was how snow, China snowboard star. As a professional athlete. So yeah. you pretty much grew up with the sport here yeah. in China. Yes, I always say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you, you know, you, you snowboard around the world competitively. Um, what impresses you the most you know when you go to a city like Vancouver mm -hmm. or you're somewhere in Europe mm -hmm. you know what are those things that are most important to you as an athlete uh, I think for, to us more important is the house the condition mm -hmm. of the snow and pipe well wider we can control that because we are outdoor sport mm -hmm. that that's things we can control but we always expect you know we want to have a good pipe because I'm a half pipe rider. Right. So we, we want, you know, have a good cut, a pipe pipe, and then good snow condition. If the weather's good, then we're lucky. In terms of these wins, what was the one that, like, really just uh, impressed you the most? I think it's the most important one was 2010, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. That's my fourth Winter Olympics, and mm -hmm. I was 18. I got hurt before that, mm -hmm. so it was you know, kind of tough, but I really enjoy the games, you know, the first time, and I got fourth place. So far, still the best in China. Right. So back in 2010, there really were not that many snowboarders. Yes. Um, how have you seen the sport grow? You know, are there, are there a lot of people, you know, wanting your autograph? You know, it's really great things to see how much, you know, improve we have, and mm -hmm. then double, triple the people doing this during the year. Snowboarding is actually decreasing in numbers across the world. I mean, I heard in America there's actually less people snowboarding, whereas China, I mean, what you're saying is it's, it's yeah. doubling, it's tripling. Because it's everybody think about, you know, snowboard is cool, fashion. <laughs> you know, young people go up there and they look so cool, you know, nice. And frankly, it's great to have someone like you who's had such success to act as a role model for that. Because, mm. you know, we've yes. said before yes. that China's been very strong on the ice, but ne not necessarily as strong on the snow. Right. Now having someone like you, like a local hero who can inspire the younger generation to pick up a new sport is, is fantastic. Right, to get yeah. fourth in the Olympics. Dr. Song and Dr. Zhang, how yep. important was you know, the perspective of athletes like uh, uh, Liu Jiayu, how important was that when you were putting together this bid? Well, it's, it's quintessential right. to the success of winter sports in China and the popularity of that particular sport. It was we, the Chinese, are known to have the body for martial arts, for, 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 for all kinds of things, for acrobatics, but then for winter sports. When you play with gravity, yeah. can we do it? Mm. It's the example, it's the role model, like Jiayu's, that has proof, okay, we, the Chinese, can do it. I can do it very well. Right. Yeah. And Jiayu basically embodies one person within this, what do they say, it's a 300 million person market in winter sports. And, you know, I think there are a lot of companies already kind of lining up to invest in this market. Um, how will that affect China's economy? It's huge. I think sport in general is becoming more and more important, as we said a little earlier, um, and winter sports will now play a big part of that. Um, I think over the next few years and the run-up to 2022, we'll see more international levels, level events coming to China mm. as so sort of test, test the venues and all this sort of thing. Right. But then also beyond 2022, I think it was made very clear in the bid presentation that China hopes to become you know, a new center for winter sports and attract more and more um, global events uh, to this part of the world. So I think we'll see, we'll see that not just in the run-up to 2022, but also beyond that.
And then, of course, there's the whole participation aspect. And, you know, this being able to attract these big events will encourage more and more people inside of China to participate in them. And, of course, you'll have the people from Beijing who will go out over the weekends. But I think it'll also have a knock on effect around the country and right. people waking up to the idea of winter sports yeah. and wanting to travel domestically. Well, to and already them. I'm seeing a lot of the international ski resorts, at least, um, uh, you know, European and American ones vying for some of these Chinese uh, skiers and, sno yeah. and snowboarders. And, and these are just for, you know, average participants, you know, not not just competitors. I mean, they're, they're looking for the Chinese tourists to go to their ski resorts. Yeah, it's a huge source. Earlier in the interview, we talked about how this is all going to impact the local community. Um, how is it going to affect those local residents on a day-to-day -day basis in the future and after the Olympics? You know, how do you envision that? Well, I think, again, it's two-folded. On the surface level, you have all the economic benefits, jobs, um, education, infrastructure, all kinds of things. Yeah. And on the deeper structure, in the deeper structure of the society, actually, because winter sports is all about the spirit of exploration and adventure. If we can have all this spirit implanted in every aspect of the society, of the civil life, then you're going to witness a whole scale bottom-up process of innovation. Mm. So that will simply be good. Mm. And another one important is, uh, uh, is, is, is the, uh, one important part of our national strategy of Jinjingji, uh, Beijing, Hebei, Tianjin, this regional coordination uh, development uh, strategy. Mm. And uh, that requires that uh, we, we uh, develop the tourism, sport, and uh, the uh, meeting conference uh, service uh, belt through the Beijing and to Zhangjiakou this, this belt. So, and we will find that uh, through the 2022 games and uh, the urbanization level of the Zhangjiakou and uh, the people's livelihood facilities will be uh, promoted uh, uh, after 2022 and uh, right. remarkably. Well, of course, there's already a lot of buzz already. You know, we talked about how all the athletes are pumped up for the 2022 Olympics. And I think as every year goes forward, we're just going to hear more. The whole community is going to be even more excited. We're going to hear more about these developments and, uh, and how Beijing is once again gearing up for the Olympics. I want to thank all of you, all five of you, for joining me today to talk about the Olympics. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks to our viewers at home for tuning in. We'll see you next weekend on Crossover. Bye for now.